I'm particularly interested in a investment. I would say superficial views on Crocs. Not only that I'm not a big fan of the design of the <laughs> shoe, but a lot of people overlooked this company. First of all, I also do not like the shoes. You do you do not have to love the product to to invest in the company. There's also an, an important fact because most beginner investors say like I need to invest in it because they have good products. That's that's not always the case. But why did I invest in Crocs? The solar industry. Why are you bullish? The solar industry is trading at stupid multiples. Welcome to Me and the Market Goliath podcast. I'm so lucky to be joined by Frizzo. Frizzo, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. It's a pleasure to meet you. I'm excited to be here and talk a little bit about investing, the solar industry. I'm ready to go. First and foremost, what does investing mean to you? So I started doing uh, student jobs when it was legal for me in the summer break and other vacation periods. I gave tennis lessons to young young kids uh, in the weekends. And through that way, I started building up some money and I wanted to do something with it because the interest rates on the banks, uh, it's not great here in Belgium. So uh, I decided I should do something with uh, the money. I started doing some research in how I can make the money work for me and generate some income from it. I learned everything myself. I searched for ideas how I could see if a stock was a good investment or not. I did everything online and that's how I started investing. I'm not sure if I want to disclose your age, but I know that you started investing at a very young age. So when did you start? I was 20 years old, I think. Yeah, that's when I started investing. And how would you describe your investment philosophy? Are you a uh long-term investor buy and hold or are you a, a trader i see i see investing more like like a second job i think it is uh, a very important uh, aspect of life and i think it will generate maybe even more income than a job i i will do so i think it is uh, very important that people take time to learn about investing but also to not lose money with investing and that's also a, an, an important factor and that's why my main philosophy is to do more like the value investing things what do i mean with that is that you make sure that something you buy is undervalued like when you go shopping in the mall you do not want to buy something expensive you want to buy when there are sales and that's also how investing works and that's what I try to, to look for in the market is to, to find things that are on sale that no one wants. And then I will buy those things with a lower risk because the price is down. Because price down means less risk. And that's when I would like to buy. And uh, that way you can also maximize your returns because you're buying uh, lower. You get the chance that it goes higher uh, and you get more returns on your money. So for me, it's, it, it's more like to find low risk and a decent reward. That's my main strategy. So you said you started in 2020 when you started investing. Yes. yes. Has your investment philosophy changed over the years? Yes, it, it did change. When I started investing, I was more looking for dividend stocks because I was not sure what I was doing. So dividend stocks are more risk-free. They provide income. And, and that was... A strategy for me, yeah, it was perfect for me because I started with a little bit of money and I just wanted to test things out. But I think investing is a process. It is a journey and you will find the process you like along the way. So after that, I also tried some story stocks. So stocks that might look great in a story like investing in elect electrical vehicles. But maybe they ha do not have the fundamentals to support the story. I invested in NEO, for example, when I began with investing. And, and I think a lot of people invested in NEO when they started with investing. But there, there are also a lot of risk with investing in those stocks because they are not profitable and they have a higher risk. And if you do not understand what the business is and where it will go to, you can lose a lot of money. So I exited the position with some loss. 
but I did learn a lot from it. That kind of investing is not the way that I want to be investing. So yeah, I did pivot a lot in the early stages of investing, but I think I did find my way of investing at the moment and more like the value investing way. For those who don't know, you have a degree in electromechanics. I'm sure a lot of people don't know what electromechanics is. I'm personally curious to know, obtaining a degree in such a niche field, has that helped you with investing? Yeah, so electromechanics is more like uh, designing machines. So it's not finance. So I did not start out with a finance degree. So that's important to keep in mind. But while I was not really uh, passionate about uh, electromechanics, I do not regret doing it either. Because uh, my back, because of my background, it is easier to understand businesses from, from those sectors. If, if I'm going into an earnings call, it is easier for me to, to understand the technical terms of things. Most of the times, uh, financial people will struggle with that. And that's an advantage that I can bring to the table. I can bring different perspectives about things that others might not think about. Therefore, I do see that my electromechanics degree is, is, is an asset uh, and I can use it while I'm doing research on stocks. So do not regret it. I want to talk a little bit more about your roots. So you're from Belgium. What's the investment landscape like? Really good question. So the investment landscape is relatively low in Belgium because we have a government pensions. When you get older and you stop with working, you get paid from the government to live your life. Therefore, the investment products in Belgium are not really great. Finding a local broker is difficult. Mostly, if you want to do investing, it goes through a bank and they offer really high fees. So it's not interesting for starting investors because if I'd want to do an investment, I have to pay like 15 euros just to start investing. And maybe I only have 50 bucks, so I lose 15 euros of my, my 50 euros. So that's, that's a lot that you lose. So that's a gigantic problem for starting investors. But we do see some changes. We do see more cost-friendly brokers. So that's a good thing. But most people still rely on government pensions and do not build up a pension themselves. And that's why I think more people should consider investing in Belgium because you can do it like a second job. It will give you a lot of returns in the long term. If you start at a young age, yes, your wealth will grow and grow over time. So the, the investment landscape uh, has a lot of work in Belgium, I think, in my opinion. But I think we will slowly get there. Mm -hmm. I think it's rare to find an investor like you. For those who don't know, you're also a Seeking Alpha contributor who writes a lot of his own investment analysis on particular companies. And I would say your analysis covers a lot of international companies. Yes, yes. And I think this is a very important aspect of the podcast is to drill in on the home country bias. Because I can imagine someone who's in Belgium may not know a lot of companies abroad, for example, in the States or even in, in China. Yeah. So how, how would you go about highlighting the importance of eliminating home country bias? And what triggered you to think of investing companies outside of your ho home country? Yes, that's a great question. I've always been very critic of everything. And I do think a lot about things. When people start with investing, a lot of the time they start with, with stocks they know and stocks that are in their own country. But that doesn't matter that those companies are performing well or are growing their business. So there is a lot more to it than just buying a good company or in your eyes a good company. That doesn't matter. That doesn't mean that you will get value from it. So the main thing for me is to find value. And if I cannot find it in Europe or in Belgium, I will look elsewhere. And that's the main idea I have. Like most people say, like, for example, China is a high risk. But at what cost, at what value, if prices are down a lot and valuations are down a lot, how do you calculate the risk then? So, for example, U.S. stocks are at all-time high valuations. That's also a high risk. So you have to wait for yourself. But 
also what is important to look at is like GDP growth. And Europe has been pretty much struggling with GDP growth. But if you look in Asia, the GDP growth is like 5%. For most of the countries, like Southeast, Southeast Asia is like a booming, booming economy that they are growing really fast. And you can find cheap stocks over there. There are still a lot of uh, opportunities, I think. And more than in the US where we have all-time high valuations. So that's what you have to weigh a little bit. But I think it is very interesting for people to not have a home country bias and look elsewhere for opportunities. How did you acquire a worldview that has led you to want to study international companies? You shared your investment portfolio with me, and I know that there are a couple of international stocks, companies in Southeast Asia, China, as well as US. What is the approach in terms of finding these companies? It started when I was younger. My dad traveled to China to do business. And I was really intrigued by that, that he was traveling the world and looking for opportunities in other countries and looking to drive business to Belgium. And that is what, what really got to me. And that's why I have also have a very open view about the world. And like, I can see opportunities everywhere. So that's why I, I am interested in China stocks, in Southeast Asian companies. So that definitely helped me to see that before my eyes. And that's why I, why I started investing also in China, because the risks that others talk about, I do not see those risks at the high level as they do. Maybe it is because my dad went to do business in China and whatever. And the second thing is that I also travel a lot. I go to places and I see how it is there and how people do things. And that's also what, what helped me a lot to study different cu cultures and yeah, to have a worldview. So that really helped me in choosing where I want to invest and brought up my view. One of the drawbacks of studying a company from a different country is that it's probably not as easy to get information, data, yeah. and probably there's a lot of skin in the game where you actually have to travel and to see how the company is developing. And especially as a seeking out for a contributor, like when you write an analysis, like you probably have to do a bit more research. So how's that process like, especially when you cover international companies from abroad? Yeah, for example, when I did research around Grab, Southeast Asian company, I have the luck that I have a Vietnamese girlfriend. So she's lived there the, the half of her life. So I have a more insight uh, into Grab's business and how well they are dominating the markets over there. So this gives me a little bit of an advantage. I also have a, f a friend who is now there and who also gave me insights about the, the business on the ground. So it definitely helps. Another thing is that I do have some contacts in China where, for example, in the Corona crisis, where I had contact with them and communicated like how are things there in Shanghai, for example, I got insights, how bad is it? And I got to tell, talk on WeChat, yeah, how bad it really was. I wrote an article about MGM resorts and they do business in Macau, for example. And at that time, it was last year, I wrote that MGM resorts would be my top, top stock for 2023, I think. But you have to consider in the, the end of 20, they had another COVID outbreak. So Macau was really pressured, but I knew that everyone had COVID, like everyone had it. So that would be like three months and then they could open up again because everyone would have COVID and they would, would be resistant to COVID. They did not even need vaccines because if you get it, you, you build up the cells against COVID yourselves. Though, so I expected China to open up really quickly and that also happens. And that's why MGM Resorts recovered a lot and, and gained like 50% in three months or something. So I think that's also a, a really interesting view and it worked out. So that's great. <laughs> yeah, I think that's one way to eliminate home country bias is to have international friends so that you can sort of fact check your investment analysis on a company. I'm really particularly interested in a investment. I think I've been following you for quite some time and I think I've expressed my, I would say, superficial views on Crocs, not 
only that I'm not a big fan of the design of <laughs> their shoe, but I think a lot of people overlooked this company. For yes, those who yes. don't know, Crocs is an American footwear company. And if you were to invest in this company in the start of 2024 to date, you would have achieved a 55% ROI, which beats the S&P by quite, quite a mile. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about this investment because I'm so curious to know why did or how did so many investors overlook this opportunity? Yeah, yeah. First of all, I also do not like the shoes. So you do, you do not have to love the product to, to invest in the company. There's also uh, an, important, an, an important fact because most beginner investors say like, I need to invest in it because they have good products. That's, that's not always the case. But why did I invest in Crocs? If you go and look to their gross margins or profit margins, they do have the best in the industry. So their business is running fantastic. Even if you compare to like high quality shoe brands, they just stop them and, and combine that with a pretty high quality business. They also were trading at a really low price to earnings. So they were trading at a price to earnings of like six, seven, maybe. And also the free cash flow was at trading at like a price to free cash flow of five or six. And that's really interesting for me because that was by far the lowest in the industry, but they do have the highest profit margins. So something did not really make sense. Most of the reason why it was priced so cheap was because they did an acquisition and it was pretty expensive and it was not running great. However, they do still have great prospects with that business. It's a little bit lower margins and also their Crocs brand really outperformed. So if you go look again to China, they have a massive growth in China and also other uh, Asian countries. So they were growing pretty decently. So their growth was like, I think, 8 to 10% revenue growth. And if you consider the low valuations and the high margins, it is a really interesting story. So I saw it as a quite obvious play to do. From a valuation perspective, no one wanted the stock, so I decided, why not? I'll buy it. And it, it's performed really good, so I'm happy. It's, it's very interesting because I, I know that Crocs, a lot of people sold off the stock in 2021 after the acquisition yeah, yeah. of Hey Dude. And I think if you look at their earnings announcement, there seems to be a rebound for this acquisition sales, mm -hmm. would you say that the bread and butter of, of this company is still the Crocs brand? Like, is it better off without the acquisition of Hey Dude? Because I think a lot of people have never heard of Hey Dude yeah. for the international market before the Crocs brand is big. I do consider Hey Dude as a promising asset. And why is that? Because now they are really big in North America, but they do want to expand internationally. So their plan is to go to Europe. From what I have heard, I also know someone that, that has Hey Dude uh, shoes. They are telling me that the shoes are really comfortable. They are easy to wear and they have really, really good comments on their shoes. So I think if they can expand into Europe and steal some market share from other shoe brands, then I think it can still be a great asset. But despite the acquisition, Crocs was still a great investment because the Crocs brand is really strong and it was still growing at, at, at a high pace and really high margins. And another thing to consider is that they have a, a buyback program running. So they are buying back shares. And if you do that at super lo low prices, yeah, then you have uh, a lot less risk of uh, downside. So you limit the downside and you increase the upside pot potential. So that was also a big factor to consider. Moving forward, do you think Crocs is still an investable company? I think it's still all right, but it won't be as great. I think you can still buy it at like 13, 14 times price to earnings. What is still below uh, the average in the industry. So I think it, it's still a, a decent or better investment in, in the industry. They still have the buyback program running. They are uh, paying down debt. They are performing on all aspects and it will still run because now analysts start to realize, oh, 
Crocs is doing pretty great. They are still cheap. They are doing the highest margins in the industry. And now you will have analysts with their buy ratings and people will start uh, pumping up the stock. So I think it will still win. I'm still holding the stock. Thanks for sharing. So what factors do you consider when you evaluate a potential investment opportunity? Yeah, so the main thing is I want to be a contrarian. So if everyone is running away, then I will consider the stock, I will do research, and that is when my interest peaks in the stock. I do not want to buy at all-time highs when everyone is hyping up the stock. That's not how I like to invest. I like to look for undervalued stocks. What does that mean? That does not mean that I'm not buying stocks above PE of 20. I also consider growth. I think growth businesses can also be value in, value investments. And I think that is a, an important aspect that a lot of people do not consider in investing. They think separately value and growth. I think it's one and they belong together because a growing business can also be underpriced or undervalued if you calculate in the growth that they will have. That's why I also started investing in end phase. They also demand a higher price to earnings ratio, but they do have the highest quality business or quality business in the solar industry. And that's why I want to pay a little bit of higher multiple, but they are also growing at a pretty high rate. Of course, now it's a little bit difficult with the solar industry, but we will come to that. But I like undervalued stocks and that's my main, main thing. Let's get right into the solar industry. I'd say that six months ago, or even to date, solar industry is contrary in investment. Yeah. Given the macro environment mm -hmm. with high interest rates. So why are you bullish in this energy sector, especially the solar industry? So to start up, the solar industry is trading at stupid multiples. They are like, if you go to Canadian solar or you go to Jinko solar, they are trading at like three times PE ratio or something like that. So it's just stupid. You're buying a business and it does not even cover the book value. So that's one thing for me that is an important factor so that we have undervaluation. Of course, Canadian solar and Jinko solar are special in that because they're also trading below industry industry average uh, PE ratio. You have like First Solar, which is one of the more expensive businesses. So I look for in the industry for the lowest, for the cheapest stocks, but also the highest quality. For example, Canadian Solar, Chinko Solar have one of the best solar panels in the industry with the highest efficiency and all, and all of that. So they have the quality and are also undervalued. The second thing is that I believe that the solar panel estimates for the coming years are underestimated. You can see in the past also people have been underestimating solar a lot. And that's why a lot of stocks have boomed till 2021. But now you do have a little bit of a difficult environment with higher interest rates. It is more difficult to get a loan. Loans will be more expensive to get solar panels on your roof. So that does push back demand. There are also a lot of policy shifts in Europe and California, for example, where the governments decide to give less subsidies or, or subsidize less. And that's a shift to consumer behavior. So in that regard, we do have some headwinds are currently in the solar sector. But we also need to consider the gigantic tailwind if we look at the solar energy. It is one of the cheapest energy you can possibly get at the market. If you go look at the solar panel prices, they are at all-time lows. Once we get lower interest rates, I do see that demand will pick up because it is one of the cheapest uh, energy sources you can have. One good example, I've been to South Africa this year. South Africa energy is really scarce. So when you are there in the day, the energy will, or yeah, the energy of the lights will fall out like three times a day because there is not enough energy. And then one big solution over there, there's a lot of sun, is solar panels. So I think people will want to be less independent on government to get energy and get their own energy, like uh, solar panels or batteries. 
And I think that will also be a driving factor to generate demand in the following years for the solar industry. So mm -hmm. you have to weigh a little bit. There are some short-term headwinds, but there are also a lot of tailwinds. We can buy now cheap undervalued businesses with a great tailwind for the long term. So I think that's also that you also need to consider those things. I think it's important for people that are not familiar with the solar industry. How does it work, right? What are these companies going to face in the short term? Obviously, interest rates is definitely going to be one. Cost of production is going to increase, potential shipping costs, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. But what are the main concerns, and specifically in the short term for these solar industry companies? They are getting pressured a lot on margins. So their profit margins are now, again, lowering because they are selling solar panels at really cheap prices. And then you also need to make a difference between retail solar panels and utility-based solar panels. The utility-based business is booming because businesses and governments do have a lot of money to invest in green energy. So they will start projects. In China, we can see it. They are building tons of solar projects with tons of solar panels. And the demand for utility-based solar is gigantic. And we can see that in Jinko Solar's latest quarter earnings, their shipments increased almost, I think, when everyone is thinking that solar is going through massive, massive economic downfall. So they are still growing enormously. Of course, their revenue is growing less because they're selling their panels for lower prices. They grew a revenue like 10%, but still, they're still doing great for a company that's trading at 10 times, three times earnings. But companies like Solar Edge and Enphase, they are more retail based. They uh, make converters for the solar panels on your roof. And people are not buying solar panels for on the roof because interest rates are higher, but also the policy shifts, like I said before. So those companies are on the most pressure right now, but that will also change really quickly if we see changes in interest rates because solar panels are the cheapest they have ever been. And what we can now see, energy prices are again rising because we have wars in a lot of places. We get a lot of pressure on energy prices. So demand for solar panels will again increase over the year because the pressure of high energy is a lot and inflation might even rise again if energy rise again. So the demand is high for solar panels, but we have to see like how the policies change if they can quickly enough that people start buying again, get more confident to buy solar panels. Also an important factor is most solar panels are no, now sold in Europe or in China or in North America, mostly California. We also have uh, emerging countries like Brazil, India, South Africa, and those countries will demand a lot of solar panels in the coming years. So that's also important to, to look out for. They have not placed a lot of solar panels. Energy is mostly out of coal or other sources. So that will still be an um, immensely growing market. So that's also important to consider. I've never invested mm -hmm. in solar in, uh, energy companies, but it's interesting because I, I think there's a lot of upside. Uh, there's, I would say that there's not a lot of argument against that because in 2023, solar generated 5% of the world's electricity. Mm -hmm. And back in 2015, it's just one. The growth potential is there and, and solar energy is third largest renewable energy resource after wind and hydropower. Mm -hmm. So I do think that there's a lot of upside. One of the questions that I have is, who are the buyers, right? Because I think the buyers, for example, as a user, I'm not informed of how much solar energy costs. Like I'd probably have to do an extensive piece of research in order to install solar panels uh, above my rooftop. I would also need to understand the regulatory process and the approval process of mm -hmm. all parties. Can you explain to my audience in terms of who are the potential buyers and what is the cost structure like for people buying these solar panels? If you are subsidized or not, if you get uh, grants from the government to build solar panels on your roof or for your business, if you deploy solar panels on your business roof, if you get subsidized or not. But even if you're not subsidized, 
currently because the solar panels are at extreme low prices, it is really interesting. And you will have a payout period of like maybe 10 years. That also depends if you place a battery or not. If you have an electrical vehicle that you can charge with the electricity you generate. So it depends. It also depends on how much electricity you use in your house. If you ha have a lot of things that run on electricity, like a vehicle, then it can be really attractive to place yourself a solar panel system with a battery so that you can charge your own car, use the electricity in your home just for free. You'll pay that back, the investment that you do, in 10 years, maybe sometimes 12. But you have to consider that solar panels, they live for like 20 years, so they can work for 20 years or more. So you have like eight years that you get energy for free. So that's a really important thing. And also if we consider inflation and higher energy prices, you can pay back sooner your, your money of, on your investment. So I think for most people, it is, it is pretty interesting. It also depends on your age, how old you are, if you want to do the investment. But I think if you're pretty young and you do have the money, you do want to make the investment, I think it is really interesting. You have to see it like an investment that you're making. So that's the main criteria. But also important, like if we go look at electrical vehicles, we also saw they were very expensive, but they've come down in price and they will come down in price more and more because everyone is going electric. All the prices will go down and they will be similar to pet petrol car or other uh, alternatives. And the same is with solar panels. The larger scale, the more vertical integrated the solar panel manufacturers are, the cheaper they can sell their solar panels. If you go look at the, the solar panel prices, the index, you can see it is just going down every year. So that's also an important factor. Prices always go down when you can make it more efficient, do higher mass production and things like that. So that also helps. I do expect that solar panel prices will go down over time and that it will be more and more interesting to place uh, solar panels on your roof or for your business or and for utility based. So for big companies, big projects to generate energy, it is really interesting right now. How much do you think infrastructure plays a role in terms of the development of the solar industry? For example, where I'm living in right now, for example, like EVs, there's not a lot of electric charging stations. And I think that's one of the reasons it's been putting me off from purchasing an electric yeah, vehicle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people would say like, oh, if oil prices continue to go up in the future, it actually makes more sense to buy a hybrid vehicle yeah. in countries where infrastructure is not so great. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts for the solar industry? How much does infrastructure play a role? I think solar panels will be more and more integrated in society. Like you have a lot of roofs everywhere. You have in cars, maybe they can integrate solar panels on the roof or for that or for whatever. So there are a lot of opportunities still to, to implement solar panels into roofs, into walls. There are still a lot of interesting ideas. I do know some companies that are doing those things, make solar panels curved and things like that to make it more usable, to implement it in everyday life so we can generate income on every place we are at or every building can generate energy to be more efficient. Because if we now look at the world, we are not yet very efficient in capturing all the solar energy, I would say. So there is still a gigantic opportunity to build implemented solar panels and things like that. So infrastructure will definitely think about that. Like I went to Disney and they have like a parking lot and you have like the roofs all are built with solar panels. All the roofs are just solar panels. It's, it's pretty cool. They just charge energy and your car is not getting wet. So those things we will see more and more, I think, in the future. That's a great insight and observation there. It's very interesting because the top five solar energy producers in terms of countries, number one is China, and then second is US, followed by Japan, Germany, and India. I've been looking at your portfolio construction. Obviously, you have Enphase in your portfolio, as well as DQ, which is it's, it's DACO, but in Chinese, it's Dachuan, solar energy. Is, is there a strategic asset allocation in two different 
solar energy companies in two different countries? So the main thing, if you have manufacturing companies, it's important that they have scale because how bigger the scale, how much more they can produce, they will have lower costs. So those companies will have the highest margins in the industry and will be able to return more to shareholders, will do more buybacks, do more dividends and things like that. If they can sell their products also at higher prices, like Enphase can do, they sell their products at the highest prices and Jinko Solar can sell their uh, products a little bit higher because they have the best panels. Then you can demand the industry leadership. And if you can then see that they are also trading at valued valuations, then it can be really interesting to invest in the industry leaders because they are the most safe because we will see more consolidation in the solar sector. We will definitely see that. We can already see that it has consolidated a lot because I think the top 10 solar panel makers have produced like 90% or something of all the solar panels globally. But yeah, the smaller businesses hurt a lot right now because prices are a lot lower. Margins are going down. They will lose money. So you want to be in the market leaders because they will have the quality to still have decent margins and do not lose too much cash. So that's an important factor when you are investing in manufacturing companies to go to the most vertical integrated companies that can reduce their costs and sell at higher prices. That's the the main goal you want to have. And I think in that way, Daco New Energy, Chinko Solar and Enphase are perfect examples of market leaders. And they will take market shares over the coming years because the others won't survive this this downturn. That's a great point. I think for me, when I look at companies, I, I definitely look at margins. Margins is so important yep. because then you can look into like their cash flows in terms of how long are they going to survive mm-hmm. with the margins that they're selling their products at. So it's a really great point that you have mentioned, especially with solar panel manufacturers. I think we've talked quite a lot about (laughs) the solar industry and it's really insightful because I'm sure a lot of people out there are really fascinated about the solar industry because it's definitely growing Mm -hmm. and you see a lot more conversations in Fintwit. There's going to be a lot of debate as we navigate through macro uncertainty Mm -hmm. and if interest rates go down, I think there's potential rebound given that I would say that the industry is quite macro driven. Yeah, yeah. The last segment of the podcast episode is to really get to know you as an investor. I think one of the biggest things that I'm always curious about with all the speakers that are invited is their biggest learning or investing mistake. I was hoping that you could share with us one today. Yeah, I, I have made a big mistake. I, I timed Meta perfectly. I also wrote uh, an article about it to buy Meta at $90 a share, but I sold too quickly. So one thing I still have to learn is to just wait, do nothing. I had a good entry into Meta, but yeah, I sold too quickly. I think I sold at like $150 and it is now sitting at $300, $400. So I missed out on a lot of return, but that's also investing. It's hard to look back, but selling too quickly is definitely a mistake that I'm still making too quickly because you always have like the period that there is a lot of hype. So maybe sometimes it is better to sit a little bit longer on your investment and just let it run. So one of the things that I still need to to work on. Uh, And the other thing is being more patient. So patience is really important in investing. For sure, if you're investing in uh, individual stocks, timing is really important. So timing will do a lot for your returns. Not buying too early is also an important factor. But I've learned a lot through the last years. But yeah, being more patient is something that I have learned a lot, but it's still a very important factor in investing to find the right time to invest. Something that also can help investors is like averaging down a position to not buy too much at the start. If it goes lower, you can buy more. So in that thing, people can also do that. I want to go back to your first investing mistake. I think it's quite interesting to learn about how you mitigate that. A lot of people would agree that 
buying is easy, selling is always so difficult, yeah. especially with mega cap stocks, right? Given that the, the recent run up with AI, yes. and NVIDIA, how do you go about avoiding that risk of selling too early, especially with mega cap stocks? Really difficult right now because every everything just keeps on running. And like there is a lot of downside risk also because prices are higher and earnings are not really following. So if you look at Microsoft and things like that, they are growing, but are they growing at the same pace as a stock price? Maybe not. So that difference, you have to look for that and see if it is still the fair value that you want to hold. If not, maybe you might consider cashing out and looking for a better investment. And yeah, that's, that's what I have done. I've sold my Meta and I bought Alphabet because at the time there was a lot of AI worries around Alphabet that OpenAI would dominate uh, AI, but that did not seem like the case. So I did mitigate a little bit of the return that I missed by transferring my invested money into Alphabet. And Alphabet did increase from like $90 to 150 so I did also make a return over there. So that's something I've done to reallocate and something I thought was more val valuable. I still think that Alphabet is the cheapest mega cap and has the highest potential of returns in the coming years. So yeah, I'm still holding Alphabet and hoping that uh, I can make back my money uh, that I missed on Meta. That's always the challenge for an investor. For any investor is constantly evaluating what is the better opportunity yeah. cost. So that really wraps up the episode. I definitely want my audience to learn more about you or, or if they could find you through your social media platforms, that would be great. How can my audience find more info about you? Yeah, so you can find me on uh, Seeking Alpha. I write uh, articles about portfolio stocks that I own myself or sometimes stocks that I do not own myself and give my own uh, opinion uh, about. Other than that, you can also follow me on X or Twitter. And yeah, I share my IDs over there for free. Definitely check that out.